The Trouble with Ollie, Part 2. Another example of Oliver's uh, kindness in a very strange roundabout way was during the early days where I was meant to be coaching him sleight of hand, but I'd go down to his place near Dorking and um, uh, and he'd just, you know, he'd go, oh, Simon, how brilliant, it's magic time. And he'd call in his friends, you know, he'd shout out to the gardener and there was a retired jockey Dobbs who was sleeping on the couch or something, you know, come on, and it's magic show. And so instead of me coaching him, it would be a magic show. So I'd have to do sort of like, you know, uh, and these old guys are six of them sitting lying on the floor, and Oliver that's completely overexcited, thinks it's the most thrilling thing that can possibly happen, and they're all drinking, and it's like crazy anyway. So, um, this time it was, uh, I'm trying to remember, I mean, it was very violent at some points where you drink a lot, and I remember him pulling a gun on a minicab driver's crutch. And firing it, obviously, it didn't have any bullets in it, but it looked like a real pistol to me. But there was stuff like that was pretty crazy. In the first couple of days, he chased me around the house with, like, rapiers. You know, he'd go, didn't you see me in The Three Musketeers, boy? And I pretended I didn't know who he was when I first met him. So I'd go, oh, no, I missed it. And he'd go, shoo, 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 with this, this fucking sword. And I'd be away, like this, and dodging around. And he'd go, you didn't see any of my movies. You didn't see me as uh, Bill Sykes in Oliver. Did you see me? My Uncle Carol Reed, Sir Carol Reed, directed that. You know they buried him under the Hammersmith flyover because he was going deaf and he was terrified of not hearing any. Oh, oh God, didn't you see? No, I didn't see that either, boss, I'm afraid. I should have seen it, but I'm not very keen on musicals. Oh, you Philistines. Do you see Miss Hannibal Brooks going over the mountains? There's a Brooksy with the elephant and... Uh, no, we to touch him and the river. Do you see me? No, I didn't see that. What about Kent? Kent's love with the devils of, you know, women in love, women in love with me and Batesy, frolicking and wrestling around, nude and wrestling and asses everywhere. And I said, no, I didn't see that either. No. So I just pretended never to have seen any of his films. And it kind of went down quite well because he was, you know, it was just whatever, you know, I didn't think it would be great to be like a sycophant to him, you know. So, um, this other time, uh, we were in the car coming back in the morning of having stayed the night there. I think I said before, you know, you could stay here tonight because pig's too drunk, but you better not fuck my wife. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I'd stayed there. And we were driving back to, to the studio, I think, in the morning and we were hung over. And, and, um, and I, I'd had a call from, you know, they, they'd been hustling me, the producer, one of them, and the director, just to try and get Oliver doing stuff because we're in uh, you know, pre-production, I think, coming up to shooting, but he wasn't really doing anything magically and it was really hard to get him to do anything, you know. And um, and so on the in the car, I thought it'd be a good time to say, um, I said to him, uh, boss, uh, it'd be a good opportunity now to do a bit of, um, like a bit of magic practice. Should we maybe do that? He goes, what do you say, boy? I go, well, maybe we should do a bit of work on the magic tricks. And he goes, Pig, stop the car. Simon, get out. I went, what do you mean get out? I said, get out of the car, you fucking Jewish homosexual cunt. I go, oh, Jesus Christ. It's raining. And we're on the, ham we're like on the M4. He goes, yes, good, get out. And so I got out of the car. I wouldn't even have a jacket. But it was, you know, and it was raining. And, and I um, was like, oh, my God. I was like. OK, so I stood there and I thought, OK, they're driving off, but they'll come back, you know, it'll be a joke and I'll, or whatever. Or they'll stop and he'll go, come on, Simon, it was only a joke. He didn't, they just drove off, that was it. And I was like, what? So, I mean, you know, I lived in West London then in Chiswick, so it was fairly near where the M4 came into London. So I hitchhiked and I got a lift and I got home drenched and um, I, got, <laughs> I got a shower and changed and I phoned my agent and said what had happened. He, he said he was very keen to know what was going on with sleight of hand, you know, teaching sleight of hand to Oliver Reed. And I said, well, it was, he chased me around with sort of rapiers and swords and things and, you know, it was crazy stuff and he pulled a gun on a minicab driver's crutch and this sort of crazy behaviour and he went, oh my God. And then he just dropped me off on the M4 in the rain. He said, what, on the motorway? You can't do that, it's illegal. I said, yeah. oh, right, yeah, like pulling a gun on someone's testicles is legal. He said, well, I'll ring you back. So Charles had then rung the producers and stuff and um, had, a, had a long chat with them and they uh, he told they took me off the film, that was it, you know, that was the end of it. And, and the producers, uh, there was another few calls and then within an hour, 
they'd reinstated me um, with like twice the money and my hands were insured for a million quid and I had another thing like a per diem of like danger money so it was like ridiculously better deal and that was it and so I think it took a day or something for that uh, anyway I, back on set uh, two days later uh, it was at Fulham Town Hall where they're filming the the marriage scene I believe it was he had to marry um, Amanda Donahue to whatever to make it legal to go on the island for the, the, the Lucy Irvin's book you know the castaway story and and uh, I show up really early again and um, and I'm walking across where all the caravans are, you know, in this par car park and this curtain starts twitching and the door opens and Oliver's in a sort of dressing gown you know, looking terrible. And he goes, Simon, come, in, come, in, come on, Simon. And I went over there and he shut the, shut the door, shut the door. I go, oh, all right, yeah, yeah, how are you doing? He goes, I'm fine, I'm fine. So did it work? I went, did what work? He said, did you get more money? I went, yes, I got a shitload more money. Good, okay, let's do some magic then. And that was that was the, that was what Oliver Reed was about. He was a really kind man, you know. Huh. I miss him, to be honest. Wow, amazing paradox of a man who, who I think his his thing was he he really played Oliver Reed he put he, he had to be on stage anytime he was in public because I had some moments with him when he he wasn't that out of it and he could sort of catch him you know reading a book quietly you know and, you know, I think he's actually quite a sensitive man you know and he 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 had to play the character of this mad hellraiser you know so I mean there were many examples having spent time you know a month, nearly a month with him every day that you know, I just was sort of crazy. One time in the White Elephant restaurant, he was being particularly um, hostile to a costume designer who were on the film who was, who was a very nice guy. I can't remember his name now. He's a sweet guy. He was a gay a camp chap. And, and, and um, you, you know, and Oliver was having a go at him, you know. He, and it was a bit uncomfortable. And I was sitting o o opposite Oliver with my back to the room. And there's a big mirror there and I could see various people arriving it's lots of showbiz people and I saw Cubby Broccoli the Bond producer um walking in and going to a table on the far side and I, I, I thought oh that would be so I said oh Oliver I said look there's Cubby Broccoli just walked in uh, you know to try and get him away from bullying this guy you know and he said um Cubby come and have a drink with me you jolly old spaghetti munching bugger the, the quiet murmur that is generally the way in these posh establishments stopped dead as Mr. Broccoli strolled over and stood right behind me, facing Oliver with a hand on my shoulder. For a fleeting moment I daydreamed that fortune and fame awaited me as the next James Bond 007. Dum diddlum dum 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 diddlum dum 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 etc etc. I could picture my name in lights as the Bond movie mogul leant over me, his face a mere inches from my own. Sadly, of course, this was not to be. Uh, Mr. Broccoli said softly, Hello, Oliver, how are you? It's very nice to see you. Ollie replied, Come on, let's have drinky poos, you lovely old cuddly beanbag. <laughs> uh, Broccoli uh, went on to say, Regrettably, this is not possible. I have a meeting over there with Harry to discuss the new picture. We're thinking of Grace Jones doing a cameo. Oh, fuck. Glad I'm not Bond. I don't much fancy a swift kick in the bollocks from that ballet-dancing battle axe. To which Mr. Broccoli wished Oliver well and returned to his table. I was somewhat relieved that Oliver had totally forgotten about picking on the costume designer and seemed rejuvenated by his chat with Mr. Cubby Broccoli. Oliver then proceeded to ask a rather pleasant young waitress a question. Listen, girlie, do you know about the Blackpool Cricket Club where men are men and women watch from the pavilion polishing our balls? Well, have a gander at this tattoo on my shoulder. It's the insignia of the Blackpool Cricket Club, a golden eagle's head. I sighed as I knew what was coming next. Oliver continued, Do you want to see where it's perched? I said, Boss, I'm not really sure she wants to, you know. Oliver said, Shut up, Simon, who asked you, bloody hell? He promptly stood up and dropped his pants, revealing his genitals. 
Sorry, my dear, my penis is rather small. Look carefully, love, you can see where the eagle is perched. And there it was, eagle's talons, tattooed on the end of his circumcised penis. A diminutive, grinning, sadistic Chinese woman tattooed me. I was with Johnny Miller just after he went to kidnap the great train robber, Johnny Biggs. The waitress asked if it hurt. Yes, my dear, it hurt like bloody hell, but I was so drunk I didn't really feel it till the next day. OK, that's it for part two. Please join me for part three soon, when we shall discuss more mayhem with one of the greats of film acting, Mr Oliver Reed. Yes, that's me, boy. Now bloody well get me a vodka and tonic and make it a triple. In fact, don't bother with the tonic. The rest of you could jolly well fuck off. Well, that's charming, isn't it? Jesus, what a way to speak to people.